Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live. Um, just want to say good morning, good afternoon to whoever, wherever you're dialing in from. I'm seeing some of the comments come through right now. If everybody can hear me and see me, give me a thumbs up just so I know the audio is working um, on your end. But again, welcome everybody to our Soulcast Media Live. I love seeing where everybody is dialing in from. We have people from California, Cairo, the UK. Oh my gosh, we have people from all over the world. And like I said, that's the beauty of these LinkedIn Lives, these Soulcast Media Lives, is we get people from all over the world dialing in. And of course, that's the beauty of these virtual events. Now, today I have a very, very special event and guest that I am very excited to welcome. And before we get to that, some quick housekeeping tips. So this is going to be about 40 minutes or so. And the topic is going to be all about how can you work a hybrid room for career success. Now, arguably, a lot of us are working from home or perhaps in a hybrid situation where maybe we're going in, half in, half at home. But regardless, there's no doubt that our everyday normal working situation has changed. So my guest today is the expert to talk about this. Now, I want you to know that these next 40 minutes, it's for you. It's for you to really ask us any questions that you might have related to communications, career, your working environment, and how you can stand out. Because, I mean, the fact that you guys are here, it tells me that you care about career success, career visibility, career advancement. And these next 40 minutes, it's supposed to be a resource for you, for you to really think about and ask us any questions that you have. So without further ado, let me introduce my guest. So my guest today is Susan Roam, and she is best, a, I mean, I don't even know how to say it. She is a best known author, a best selling author of several books, including How to Work a Room, which sold over 1.2 million copies. Uh, she's also, she actually started out as a teacher. That's actually the foundation of her career, which for me, in my opinion, makes her one of the best guests because she's all about teaching. She's all about teaching you the skills that she has found to really work for career advancement. Now, one of the my favorite things about Susan is she's worked with, of course, a lot of big clients, Coca-Cola, the US Air Force, United Health Group, Yale University. But she was actually also quoted by Sir Richard Branson. Uh, I'll have Susan share that story with us once I invite her up. But let me introduce Susan to you. Susan, welcome to our SoCast Media event. How are you doing? Well, I as people can see from the picture and to now, I have my COVID coiffure, natural white. So I'm a little different looking than the picture, but I'm the same person. Still looking fabulous. So Susan, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I know I did a really quick introduction, but I know that just doesn't cover the amount of work that you have done in these last I don't know, a decade or so. I mean, you've done a lot. So tell us about the work that you've done. Well, it's so interesting that you mentioned career success because I even forgot that for three years I was the outside coordinator for the San Francisco Examiner's Career Series where every week we featured an article, which I wrote many of them, and brought in other people who had something to say who would help people who read the business section who wanted to manage their careers. Uh, of course, my tidbit is when I was writing How to Work a Room and Secrets of Savvy Networking, I plagiarized my own columns that I wrote because it was made it a little easier. Um, and yes, so let's say this to our, our participants. Being a former teacher means you could take the teacher out of the classroom, but never the classroom out of the teacher. So I will be giving you homework. Oh, no. That just like sparked a bit of anxiety in me. But I know this is homework that it is good for our career. So. And, and I, when I first started How to Work Room, it was done. I mean, I wrote that book and even came up with that thought because I did a career change workshop here in San Francisco. And one woman who was very participating, very voluble, when I said, well, you know, you could go to the association of whatever and meet a lot of people instead of making like one person at an informational interview, she said, oh, I could never do that. I could never go and talk to people. And I realized what she was talking, and I always felt like saying to her, really, you haven't shut up for three nights, but I didn't say that. But what I realized is you can be conversant, 
that doesn't mean walking into a room full of people you don't know is comfortable. Yeah. And that was the spark that had me start thinking about how to work a room and how we can manage our mingling and our socializing in a business setting, which is a little different from social, but not all that different, but make it work for us. So I've always thought of the ability to be in any room as your visibility. Yes. And, and when you're visible, what you want to convey. But here's what I will say this from the beginning, Jessica. If you choose not to show up, you are missing out on opportunities. So the first thing I always say to people is when that invitation comes for a Zoom or mm -hmm. for an event that might hopefully be COVID safe, yeah. look at your calendar and if it works, especially if it's outdoors, RSVP and yeah. then show up. What you don't want to be known for is the person who says, oh, yes, I'll be there, but doesn't show up because a better invitation came along. So mm -hmm. look at your calendar, look at the invite, see if it fits, RSVP, and show up. Because when you're in that Zoom room or a, a regular room, which could even be a Giants game at the playoffs or the World Series, being there creates possibilities that you wouldn't have otherwise. Okay. So I, so actually the reason why Susan's saying that is because prior to us starting this, Susan and I were actually chit chatting a bit and we were talking about, you know, the people who are going to be on this. And first of all, we're so happy that you guys are spending again, your morning or afternoon or your evening with us. And the fact that you guys are here again, I want, and I'm sure Susan will agree. We want you to get the most of this event. So if you are here, Again, I'm seeing people type in where they're dialing in from, and I, I appreciate that. I love seeing all the different cities, but I want you guys to also comment, comment, ask questions so we can see you and your name. And this is actually a very good practice for some of the things we're going to be talking about today, which is even though you're here, do people know you're here? Do people see your name? And that is actually part of building visibility in your career. Now, I know for some of you, you guys just jumped on. I want to do a really quick welcome before we dive into today's content. Again, I'm here with my friend Susan, and we are going to be talking about this topic today. How can you work this hybrid room for career success? And arguably, a lot of this has to do with communications, how to engage in small talk, how to speak up. Now, we haven't dived into any tips yet, which we'll do in just a few minutes. But again, this is for you. And we want you to be a part of our conversation because again, this is good practice in gaining that visibility. So without further ado, so Susan, I have a whole list of questions that I have for you. So get ready. Okay. So let's start. One of the questions I have for you is, so your, I feel your specialty, Susan, is really kind of those like soft social skills and people who are introverted, for example, have a very hard time, especially putting people, and I can say this because I'm pretty introverted, it's like, how do you speak up in a virtual setting, in a Zoom call, make small talk with people when nobody is around? Because it's just not the same as being in person. So what are some of your tips for small talk? And maybe why is it so important to do so? Well, I'm going to take your last question first, because that is, I've been the small talk proponent for 40 years. And because really in the last four decades, people would say, oh, I don't do small talk. It's not important. So what I would like everyone to do is to do a little attitude adjustment. Uh, and I quoted in How to Work a Room, um, a very famous historic producer, um, Alexander Korda, who said, small talk is the biggest talk we do. It's the information that creates that which we call bonds. So you might find out through small talk that you both like the same team, the same author, the same restaurants, the same food. And I know people go, well, that's so insignificant. No, it isn't. Just get a Chicago person to talk about the Cubs or Sox. It's really important. Um, or get a person from New York talking to a person in Chicago about deep dish or 
eating pizza with a fork and knife. <laughs> now, some of you are sitting there going, I can't believe she said that. Some others of you are going, go, you know what? She's right. Small talk is the biggest talk we do. You can't walk into a room or a Zoom and start on a gut wrenching. I mean, you could start talking about famine, war, you know, nuclear. But, you know, when people are relaxed, especially in a room, if they have a drink and a beverage in one hand, hey, don't start with that. Start with the little things, the things you have in common. If you're in a Zoom room, you're there because there's a theme there's a, a, a purpose. Start with that. If you're in an actual room or space or event, it's the surroundings. I personally go to everything outside. It, sometimes I have to ask for heat lamps because it's so foggy and cold. But use the environment. Use the event. Use the weather. Um, I once listened to a gentleman from CNN say, say we have one joke in the weather world. It's a meteorological joke. What do people talk about when they don't know each other? The weather. I never got the joke at all because the reality is that I think the research is that 85% of us talk about the weather. And here's the best part that he did say. It's because it's happening to all of us. Mm -hmm. It's what we have in common. So small talk is important, you can start with the little things, and then it segues naturally to the bigger things and careers. But if you have to start somewhere, and I'm going to give you a hint that I call it the Susan Rowan Bonnie Raitt School of let's give them something to talk about. Even on a Zoom, wear something that people notice. Today I'm wearing my own white hair, but sometimes it's, a, a, a tie, a pin, um, a, a cap that has a message. I have one cap that has the message that says, get over it. And I had someone like read it back to me after I got upset with something. It gives people something to talk about. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice the uh, Secretary of State Albright always wore a pin mm -hmm. and said, I heard her on the John Stewart show, so it must be true. When she wore a pin and was dealing with heads of state who never dealt with a, women, a woman, and they didn't know how to start a conversation, she gave them a focus to look at that pin so they could feel they started the conversation. So help people with a tie, a scarf, a cap, something that people can notice and start and then they felt they started the conversation. You could do that on Zoom, you could do that in a room. You know, it's very interesting with small talk. I find that there's people who are just naturally really good at it, right? They're a really good conversationalist. They just know how to make people feel very comfortable. But of course, there's people on the other camp where they're like, I'm not really sure what to talk about. You know, I want to make sure that I'm still coming off as professional. And then they kind of just talk themselves into maybe second guessing whether or not to small talk. So for those people who have this, maybe even level of like anxiety sometimes, right, of engaging with people, especially if they don't know them, what would you say, what can they do to get over that anxiety of talking to strangers, even though it's really important? Well, the first thing is you're not alone. Because according to the research from the Stanford Shyness Clinic, um, this was... Uh, in the 80s, and it actually increased, um, they said 80% of people self-identify as shy. Mm -hmm. By the time we came out with the third update of How to Work Room, the number jumped to about 93%. And they went back to Dr. Zimbardo, and what do you attribute this jump in people saying they're shy, and I would include introverts, and he said technology. And that's before we had texting and Instagram, which we didn't have yesterday, but that is that technology is one of the things that's made us more uncomfortable. But for the people that consider themselves introverted, I would like to say this. Let's stop labeling ourselves and we should not label other people because you never know. Um, the thing that I know about, I did a couple articles on introversion for um, SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management. 
people have talents, they mm -hmm. have skills. And you know what we are, and this is based on originally Jung, the Jungian philosophy, which he said, we are what we need to be when we need to be it. And here you are, Jessica, saying that you consider yourself introverted. And I'm sitting here going, you got to be kidding. You don't come <laughs> off as introverted. And so really it's how we self-assess is one thing. But how we present ourselves could be totally different. There are some people who don't think they're introverted, who don't think they're shy. And I think they are. So you own who you are. And remember, we are all talented, we have skills, and we all have something to talk about because we all have interesting stories. We have interesting backstories. And you could say, well, I want to be professional. I'm going to share this story. When I first started my business, I went to Women Entrepreneurs in San Francisco back in, I'll just call it yesteryear. And um, there was a woman who said to me, you know, Susan, you know, I was a former teacher. She goes, you, you're you need to develop two personalities. You know, you need a more business-like personality. It's it's not the same as your regular and like, and I actually thought about it for a week. Then I thought, I could see my grandmother sitting on my shoulder going, Susan, how much time do you have to create a second personality? And so she did ask me at the next meeting, did you think about what I said? I said this, and this was, I think, one of my best answers ever. I said, I'd love to have two personalities. But since I turned 40, I could only remember one. So I think when we try to be more businesslike, yes, when we're in a meeting, when we're in an interview, we should be appropriately professional. But when we get to the point that we think we're being professional, we're usually so serious that people, I hate to, it's the constipated look. We need to loosen up a little and realize, especially, I want to say post-COVID, but we're not post-COVID, things have changed. You're in my office. I mean, mm -hmm. I, sometimes I do this from my dining room. I've watched TV where I see important people with many degrees, and you're in their kitchen. Yep. They're probably so happy they don't have to serve you food. They're well, glad to welcome you in their kitchen. But for the introverted person, it's important to know that you have something to offer mm -hmm. and to look at introversion as it's something, but don't self-label because then you will self-filter and keep yourself from other people. It's so funny that, and by the way, I would love to hear people's comments. I know a lot of comments are coming in about what people generally talk about for small talk. If you guys have any suggestions of things that you typically realize, hmm, I do talk about that, throw it actually in our chat function, whether it's on the right or left side or on the bottom, depending on how you're viewing this right now. But I'd love to kind of get a conversation going in terms of seeing what are some of the things that people generally talk about that actually you found has been really good conversational starters. Um, you know, you mentioned, Susan, about the idea of people feeling that there's like two sides to them at work, right? You know, you have your your fun personality side where you're with family and friends, but then you have this professional side. And, you know, it's so funny because I remember early on in my career, I always thought that I had to act a certain way to be taken seriously. And I found that that way made me as a person seem very sterile. And that's because I wasn't showing much personality. I wasn't comfortable telling people what I was interested in. I kind of just largely kept things to myself. And again, I think maybe this is, you know, cultural influences or just my personality, but I really felt that I had to, again, act a certain way. But fortunately, it didn't take long for me to realize that, hey, the more I'm willing to share express, the more people were willing to want to actually have conversations with me. They actually, as a result, found me interesting to talk to. So I completely agree with you. You know, this idea of this professional self where you're kind of like, hmm, you know, acting a certain way to have like the, the bravado. I don't think that's kind of what people gravitate for, especially now. I feel like people want to work with people that they relate to. And I agree. I think kind of small talk is that foundation to get started. 
So yeah, let me just if, for anyone taking notes, I'm flattered because I'm a former teacher who loves people to take notes. But if not, just remember this. It's something I tell my audiences every time I do a presentation. It's in my books. Bring who you are to what you do. Yeah. Because people connect with who you are. I mean, if you're one of 10 kids, people are fascinated. If you have 10 kids, they're even more fascinated. If you're someone who volunteers at the local um, homeless shelter, that's a conversation. If you're someone that trains guide dogs for the blind, I mean, bring who you are to what you do. What you do is important. For you, what you said, the connection yeah. and what builds relations is, who are you? So, Susan, one of the things I wanted to ask you today, which, by the way, I want to say there's over 50 of you guys right now joining us on this call. So, again, so happy that you are here. I'm seeing a lot of the comments come in. So, again, if you have any questions for me and Susan, throw it in the chat function because, again, this time is for you. I want you guys to be able to ask us anything and feel comfortable with it. So, Susan, one of the things I want to ask you is I know a lot of companies, maybe not so much now, I don't know. You guys can let me know if companies are still doing these, like, happy hours, these, like, social hours where they, you know, gather a team together and, you know, Maybe it's like Friday at four o'clock in the afternoon. And the idea is to get teams that are spread apart to come together and socialize. Uh, what are your thoughts about those? And if companies are still doing it and people are participating, perhaps because they have to, uh, how can they, I guess, uh, socialize or network in these situations where everyone's on a video call? Um, I don't know if people, companies are still doing this, but I know when COVID first started, a lot of companies were. Yeah, no, they were. In fact, they they were doing. Um, in fact, one of my friends worked for Nerdball, and they were having wine tastings. And one of my friends is a sommelier, and he has been working constantly because they do wine tastings online. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll the, they'll send little mini bottles of whatever, and you all taste. People are being very creative. Um, some of that may, and I don't know the answer to that, may have diminished, but I think companies are working really hard to keep teams together. Here's the thing to realize. There have been remote workers for 30 years. True. We all think this is only since COVID. No, it isn't. How do you bring the, the team together? And people did use Zoom. People did use mm -hmm. Skype, you know, yes. WebEx. So here's your choice. You can say, uh, I got to go to this. Or you can say, and this is the attitude change. And I learned this from a woman here in Northern California, when back in the old days, when we went to events and, and business mixers, she and her husband were in business together. And they would say, Oh, we got to go to this. And then one day she went and she talked, they talked to a person and they had a great time didn't even matter if that person became a client or not. And she realized, oh, wow, that was fun. And she said that they consciously changed their mindset when invited, and this includes to a Zoom, what they would say out loud is, I wonder who will get to meet. And I know I met, I, I went to, and it was actually a, an online fundraiser, political, and I got to meet someone that was one of my heroes. And let me tell you what you can do. You can use the chat function and write that person a note. You can yeah. say, oh, you can say, I love your necklace. Or you can say, oh my goodness, I am so uh, honored to be on this with you. I've, I've read your book. I've read your white paper. I've heard you speak. And this goes back to what Richard Branson quoted me on. You know what? He quoted me, never gave me a free ride anywhere. But that's another story. Uh, Richard Branson quoted what I call the remedy for the roadblock of wait to be introduced. I, I, instead of the old saying, good things come to those who wait, I coined my own version. And I want you to remember this or write it down. Good things come to those who initiate. And so that means go to the chat, notice something, 
say something. Uh, if you'd like, uh, put in your LinkedIn link. Um, if you, if you, that's not the way you would really prefer to communicate. You can go back to the person and say, Oh, uh, do you have a, uh, I would like to text you. Which do you listen to this? Which do you prefer? Just cause we're on LinkedIn. We think the whole world wants to talk on LinkedIn. Like some people want to do email. Some people mm -hmm. prefer text. So uh, some people who have, um, iPhones want to do a FaceTime. Ask people what they prefer because that way you'll make them feel comfortable. And the whole idea is, and I'm going to give you this, whether you're in a Zoom room or a regular room, etc. Instead of worrying about, oh my God, what am I going to do to make myself comfortable? Flip that. And this is the question every time you show up online or in a room. What can I do to make people comfortable with me. If that becomes your mindset, then you extend yourself. You're the host. You naturally do that. We all know how to be hosts. Um, make people comfortable. Give them food. Give them beverages. Take their coat. But it's even more than that. It's making people comfortable that they know you're interested in them. Like we That's all want to be interesting. But showing interest in people makes them relaxed and comfortable. Susan, that is gold. And I think that is truly communications in many ways, right? Sometimes, and I think we talked about this yesterday. So Susan and I were chatting before this, you know, communications and being a good communicator, it's not rocket science. It, it really isn't. Of course, it, there's like techniques of how to speak more clearly, what language, words, body language, right? Things that I talk a lot about actually on Soulcast Media Live, but ultimately, when people think of you and they think of your communications ability, they're really thinking, how does it feel engaging with you? How does it feel engaging with you, right? Or it, they're not thinking, oh, is her vocabulary sophisticated, right? They're just wondering, wow, you know, when I chatted with Jessica, when I chatted with Susan, I actually really enjoyed that conversation. What did Jessica or Susan do? They made the other person feel heard. They made the other person feel that we were interested in communicating with them. And that's the art of communications that I feel like a lot of people don't talk about. They are just so honed in on the message that they want to send out. But I think in the end, as humans, we we make decisions emotionally, right? I, I mean, that's objectively, we make things emotionally, <laughs> as funny as that sounds. But, you know, because as humans and, you know, human nature, we just kind of a lot of times go with like our feelings, right? So when we think back to a certain person, how did it make us feel or, or not, right? So I think that's really the art of communications. By the way, we have been chatting for over 30 minutes now, Susan. That just blew by. But again, I want to let everybody know, if anybody has any questions for Susan, I please start a function in the chat function. We're talking about how to work the hybrid room. So Susan, do you have any high level tips for folks? who are on this call right now, who are wondering, okay, so yes, I am working from home or maybe I'm working in this hybrid situation. What are some things that I need to think about for my career success, my communications? Susan, things that you have seen work really well for people. Okay, one of the things is show up. One of the other tips I would give is, and I wanna give this on conversation. I wrote, what do I say next? There are many people that will tell you, just ask a lot of questions and let people talk about themselves, their favorite subject. That was Dale Carnegie. And I love him as much as anybody does. Don't do that. If all you're doing is asking questions, you actually come off sounding like an interrogator. Mm, so I'm going to give you a conversation is a trifecta. It's I call it bring your or wherever you go, O-A-R. Observe, share observations, ask questions, of course. And the third one is reveal. So you can paddle your way through any conversation if you have this or. If you're always asking questions, you're nosy. If you're always giving observations, you're pontificating. If you're always revealing, trust me, you will reveal too much. But 
a little bit about who you are, what you're interested in. And, and the bottom line to all this, and you just alluded to it, Jessica, is listen. And this is the Susan Rowan version. People tell you what they want to talk about. But if you're worried about what do I say next, you're missing the subject. And by the way, if we go everywhere with our agenda, it's as if you have it pasted on your forehead. If you go on a Zoom and you have an agenda and you have to, excuse me for saying this, upchuck your self-introduction, because that's how it sounds to me, with your branding, you're missing that more relaxed connection. So here's your self-introduction. If you want to write this down, great. It has three parts, your self-introduction, Number one, it's seven to nine seconds. It's not a 30 second elevator pitch. You're not in an elevator. And even if you were, who wants to listen to 30 seconds about anybody? Seven to nine seconds, because it's a pleasantry. Second part, you link it to where you are at the time. If you're in a Zoom that's a fundraiser for the Leukemia Society, your introduction comes through that. If you're in a Zoom because you're in where we are today in a LinkedIn Live with Jessica mm -hmm. Soulcast, then it ought to come that it, people know why you're here. And then the third tip, and that comes from my friend Patricia Fripp, uh, who is an amazing executive speech coach. Don't give your title, especially if you're trying to manage your career. She said like this, Rowan, tell people not to give their title. Give the benefit of what you do. Mm -hmm. And that is so important. Instead of saying, well, I was the vice president of, you know, counting widgets, you could say, oh, I'm the one that kept all the widgets in order. And say it with enough of a little lilt that someone might smile and you get, you're giving them something so they can say, well, what does that mean? Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Then you get to explain a little, and here's the magic. You stop yourself, and you turn to the other people, whether you're in a breakout set room on Zoom or in a regular room, and you say, and what about you? Then they That's talk. Powerful. And it's, it's what about you? And you don't say, and what do you do? Because some people may not like what they do. Some people may be between jobs. And what about you invites them to talk about whatever is of interest. It could be their volunteer work. Yeah. It could be their studies. And then you're in a conversation. So three ways to introduce, there are three tips to your self-introduction and three ways that we make conversation. O-A-R, observe, ask, and reveal observe, ask, and reveal. You don't want to do too much of any of those things, but it's a balance between. And I love, I love what you said, what about you? Not asking them, what do you do? It's what about you? It was driven home to me when I spoke in Palm Springs and I, at the airport afterwards, um, I bumped into a couple and he said to me, thank you for that. I said, why, uh, you know, he said, that night we went out with, to dinner with a colleague and I knew about her husband. She never mentioned that he was in a wheelchair. And so I didn't know that if he worked, I didn't know what he did. But instead of asking what you do, I just turned and said, and what about you? And that opened up to give him the leeway for a fascinating story of what he was doing that might not have fit into the career mold. So getting that feedback from that gentleman of how he felt it saved him in conversation and allowed someone else to open up actually meant the world to me. That is such a powerful story because sometimes I think instinctively, naturally, a lot of us will be like, I do this. What do you do? Right. That's like a very networking kind of question, but sometimes you don't realize that that's actually a question that can make people uncomfortable because you don't know what their current situation is. Right. And then, you know, again, then that can spark a lot of that anxiety of, Maybe whatever they tell you, maybe it's not 100% accurate. It's just because they just don't know how to answer that question because they're currently, presently in a 
perhaps uncomfortable situation or they're transitioning or whatever. So I really like that open-ended question. Just what about you? You know, it's just, you know, it's, there's a beauty in that. Um, there's one question that I want to pull up right now. It's actually from my really good friend, Brooks. So Brooks, thank you for being here. I love seeing your name. So Brooks, this is, um, Susan, this is actually my good friend, Brooks. The question that he has for you is, hi, Susan, what are some things that people can do to make themselves feel more comfortable as they are entering into these rooms? Brooke, you're on the payroll because that's the best question. You know, that's the important thing is what do you do to make yourself comfortable? You prepare. It's the five P's. The prior preparation promotes successful performance, etc. So here's what you do. A, you know how you're going to introduce yourself. So having your thought about your self-introduction, so you know what you're going to say tied to that event, that's one thing. The other thing to make yourself more comfortable is find out what the dress code is for the event, even online. I mean, I was at a, believe it or not, I've been to three live stream funerals and, and condolence, whatever. Well, really show some respect. You don't show up looking like a schlub. You're still, I mean, you're in someone's home. It's grief time. Dress accordingly. I, I've also, I mean, I was at a baby shower. Well, that's kind of different. You don't dress like you're mowing the lawn. So when we are invited to an, an actual event, you, if you will feel more comfortable if you dress accordingly. The other thing to do is, I always said, read the paper. My fifth grade teacher said, in order to be um, conversant, you have to be well-informed. To be well-informed, you have to be well-read. That includes the newspaper. How lucky are we now? We can read it online. We can read it on our watches, though I don't know how anyone could see anything. But <laughs> it, you can get content curated. You wake up in the morning and then Google sends me a ton of things about things that they think I'm interested in, but I'm not. But you can, newspapers are online. You can go to Twitter, you can go to LinkedIn. I mean, there are so many ways, but you have to know what's going on, not only in your community anymore, not only in your city, but in the world. We are in a global situation. We have someone here from the UK uh, we have, you know, we have people from all over. So I think how you prepare is when you feel that you are informed. You have your introduction ready. And as you walk into the Zoom, et cetera, or the room, take a deep breath. Okay. Also, I'm going to give you a tip from Patricia Fripp. When you need water, have something with a straw so that when you drink your bottle, no one looks up your nose on Zoom. <laughs> I love it. So we, okay, it's been about 45 minutes, Susan. You and I have just been chatting and I think, and I just love our conversations. You're just dropping all these golden nuggets of things that people should be thinking about. And that's kind of like the beauty of these events, really. It's, you know, a casual conversation with a guest and I'm just, Susan, I'm just so honored that you decided to spend your early afternoon with us. So as we kind of wrap up here, is there anything that you want our audience to take away in terms of the working situation, which of course, for a lot of people, because work is, has changed so much for a lot of us in this year and a half, but, you know, given this fluidity in our work situations, what I'll call it, you know, how can people continuously maintain their visibility um, continuously feel empowered to communicate and communicate well, given that maybe, yeah, a lot of us are working in this hybrid situation. So any other last minute tips you want to share with our audience here today? It goes back to the stats and shyness. We're all in the same boat. And I think when you, as stressful as this is, um, and some of it is beautiful, to be honest, because of the pandemic, I'm in better touch with a lot of people. How come I didn't figure out that you can actually have a Zoom room with your, as we do once a month, girlfriends from grammar school or your former colleagues? Staying in touch with former colleagues is so important because they're the people that are going to tell you about what's 
going on at their place that there might be an opening. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you the three traits of the savvy networkers that will help you. The first is always acknowledge. When someone's done something for you, the savvy networkers, it's not just that they gave you a gift with a bow. It could be a gift of time, a lead. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just listen to you, acknowledge people. So thank you, Jessica. I have enjoyed this so much. You are such a talent and such a spirit. The second trait is that stay in touch. The savvy networkers stay in touch when they need nothing. We all know people who stay in touch and they always need something and we get so irritated. You be the person that stays in touch and make what I call the how are you phone call. How are you? It's not about what I need. Make the in-between phone call so that people know you're interested and you're thinking of them. Mm -hmm. And then the third trait is follow-up. The difference between the people, I believe, who have career success is not just that they have visibility. They follow up. Today, follow up with the people that you've seen. Um, be the initiator. If, if Richard Branson liked it, you should do. Don't wait for people to say, hey, let's have a call. Initiate. Are you available? And here's a tip. When you offer an invitation to meet with someone online in a Zoom or a WebEx, et cetera, don't just say, let's get together sometime. Give two possible dates and times because that shows that you really mean business. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is some of you haven't had a chance to ask a question, but a question might come up in a week. Feel free to email me. I, you know, I that's your homework. <laughs> Email me if you have this. And everywhere you go, I want you to read that paper and think of what's going on worldwide. It's Susan, S-U-S-A-N, at Susan Rowan, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E.com. If you have a question, email me. Tell me that you were in the Soulcast Media, and I will take the time to respond. I love it. That's that's, an, that's a homework that I think is definitely not something that anybody should be scared about because you are one of the most approachable people ever, Susan, because you're just always about helping people, sharing what you've known in these you know many, many years of this work where you're just teaching people how to network, how to work the hybrid room. You know, All these things are very important that I think a lot of us kind of go through our work days without really thinking about it. So as we wrap up here, Susan, thank you so much for being here. To everybody who stayed with us this entire 40 minutes, again, thank you. We uh, do these Soulcast Media Lives about twice a month, and it's always revolved around communications, confidence, career. I mean, those are like three C's. <laughs> that was a coincidence. Another C. But anyways, being cheesy here another seat. Anyways, okay. So again, these sessions are really for you guys to really just think about communications, workplace success. And I'm just so happy for those who have consistently uh, attended these events. And like Susan says, showing up is really just half the battle. And once you're here, it's just really listening and just seeing how a lot of the things that we're talking about today can apply to what your current workplace situation is. So I um, just want to let everybody know that my next guest is going to be in about two weeks, and it's going to be with the CEO of Prezi. And it's a, a talk I'm actually very, very excited about. I use Prezi all the time. So that's going to be in about two weeks. So if you're not already on our email list at Soulcast Media, be sure to get on it because that's how we notify you of these events and where you can RSVP so you guys get notified immediately. Susan. How can people find you? Where can people get in contact with you? I know you just shared your email with everybody, but where else can people find you? Well, you can go to my website and there are many articles, including in my blog of how to work the room and Zoom. Um, it's, to, I didn't even know the word branding back in the day, but it's SusanRoan.com, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E.com. But I'm going to add something I learned when I was a teacher from the fourth grade teacher next door. If you have a burning question, I don't want you to get an ulcer. If you have a burning question, 415-461-3915.
because Miss Edith said that to her fourth grade classroom. Don't make your parents crazy about uh, the new math. You call me and I'll help you. And I thought, how powerful. So if you really have a burning question, call me, email me. And, um, and by the way, if you th think about buying a book, please support your local independent bookstore. Susan, you've been great. And again, thank you everybody for joining. And I hope to see you guys all soon in our next event. And again, you can find our work here at Soulcast Media either on my LinkedIn page, Jessica Chen, or on our website, soulcastmedia.com. Again, thank you, everybody. And again, most importantly, thank you, Susan, for your time. I'll talk to you, everybody, soon. Bye. Bye.